guys, what up? It's the kid, it's the kid, it's the kid here for a first of a weekly series, which is top five. You know, it's a um, top five, it could be a top five movies, top five performances, top five this, top five that, that are going to be movie themed or a TV themed, but mostly movie themed because, of course, you know me as the movie merchant. So, for the first episode of this week, we're going to do top five sequels. So how did I come about with doing this sequel? So this is what I did. I said, in order to make the list, it's not just about being a good sequel. It's dependent on what film were you following up. How good was the original film? So, because my thing is that I want to apply Dodd to this whole thing, which is degree of difficulty. So the Dodd of this is the difficult task you had to in following up a classic. And a film that many people deemed perfect. Like, how do you improve upon perfect? How do you even follow up a perfect? And that is what um, I wanted to try and do here. So, again, um, it, it, it was tough making the list. But I think the key thing to, to keep in mind is these sequels were based off of classic films. You have, to, that's, you have to understand. It's not just based off good films. It has to be classic films. Hence why these sequels gain extra kudos based on the difficulty they had in trying to create a story that was a worthy follow-up of what came before. So before we go into the top five, I want to just do some um, honorable mentions, man. Um, so honorable mentions, so these are, these are the ones that didn't make the list. Ghostbusters 2, this is it's pretty, it's pretty damn good, that's Bobby Brown's song. Rush Hour 2, um, Terminator 2, Two Towers. And those are those, those are the ones that I have. Obviously, other guys can put in here, but those are, the, I think, honorable mentions. I think, and the reason why those didn't make the list is Ghostbusters is, you deem a classic. Ghostbusters 2 was a quality sequel, but I don't think it was as good of a sequel to make a top five. Rush Hour 2, Rush Hour isn't really seen as a classic. It's seen as a very good comedy. It's not seen as a classic. And Rush Hour 2 just was, blew it out of the water. Um... See, Two Towers, you can put it because Fellowship of the Ring is seen as, as a, a classic film. But I just think that Two Towers was a damn good sequel, but the five I picked, it just quite didn't crack the top five list. Um, T2 was an, it was an, an interesting one, man, because T2, um, I had it on the list. But then the reason why, because again, it was hard to make, make the list, but the reason why I took T2 off the list is that first ten minutes of film, you could argue it's a classic, but I don't think it's as much of a classic as the sequels to these films that made the five lists. So that's my thing. T2 for me is one of the greatest films of all time. I'd argue it's probably the greatest film of all time when you put everything into account. But I just think that T2 didn't have as difficult a task following up Terminator 1 as these other five films did following up the films that they, that they did. So that was really, that's, that's how I had to come through in there. And I think now people will say, oh, what about Dark Knight? What about Dark Knight? Again, I was not a fan of Dark Knight. But even if we're to be objective and so forth, Batman Begins was not a classic film. It was a damn good Batman film, but he had issues. But Batman Begins was not seen as a classic. So even if Dark Knight did what it did, even if Dark Knight was the proper sequel that it should have been, it still wouldn't make the list because Begins was not as much of a classic. So... Without further ado, let's get into the list. So, number five. They have it. The Empire Strikes Back. Now, people say, how for you psycho? I'm sure a lot of Star Wars mentioned, like, how do you have um, Empire Strikes Back so far down? But you'll see the list. So, of course, the reason why it makes the list is the first Star Wars film is a bloody classic. An absolute classic film. It's it's an iconic film, and I think it's made such a huge impact. You think, how do you follow up what was pretty much a cultural um, f f phenomenon? I think Star Wars was the first film where people watched it for like fifty four four forty times. I think what Empire Strikes that was what Empire Strikes Back did that was so good was it said, you know what, we're gonna change the, the tone. We're gonna really expand upon what you saw. Which is in that intro in where we see the 8080s and and Hoth and so forth. We're gonna make it a lot more of a darker story, get more characters, increase the scope, and it has one of the greatest twists we've ever seen. 
Just it, it is it is one of the greatest twists we've ever seen in any film. So I think when you look at that, that is what makes it such a worthy sequel because of um, that twist where it left things. But even if it's, it's it's left things in a place of where you are desperate to see what's happened in part three, it still works as a quality film in a, in and of of itself. So I just think that you know so. It was coming off, like for me, I appreciate Star Wars. I just don't think Star Wars is as good as what people think it is, but I appreciate how crazy it would have been coming out in 1977. You have to think about it. Watching Star Wars now or 10 years ago, 20 years ago, ain't it? If that film coming out in 1977 was crazy, so the fact that I think it was 1980, Empire Strikes Back said, you know what, we're, 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 we're going to see what's up, and it delivered what many people believe it is superior to the first. See, I prefer Star the first Star Wars to Empire Strikes Back, but I can understand how people can say Empire Strikes Back is a sub superior film based on what it did. So, yeah, um, but again, one, one again, one of the craziest scenes when Darth Vader fights Luke. That's just one of the craziest scenes in a um, cinematography way and just in a filmic way. And what happened in that scene, bro? That scene is quoted um, a, a billion times, man. And also, when you peep it, just look at it's director. So that is the number five Empire Strikes Back. So, number four. Now, this may surprise people. The Matrix Reloaded. Now, people say, why the hell would you have reloaded up in this piece? Half of, are you psycho? Let me explain. Many people deem The Matrix a perfect film. It's a sci-fi classic, and I would argue that The Matrix had a greater impact on cinema than Star Wars did. You could argue that The Matrix is one of the most impactful films in cinematic history. So when you just think of what that film did, you say to yourself, how the hell do you follow up that? And this is the thing with Reloaded. I believe that for some people, they couldn't see a sequel in The Matrix. You see, if the... Beauty of Bar Reloaded is it didn't um, tread amongst common grounds. It didn't just regurgitate something like The Matrix. Just say, oh, let's The Matrix, let's just do the same thing and have the same beats. Because what Bar did is everything you saw in part one, we're going to make it bigger. The action scenes were better. The story got deeper. The philosophy got deeper. The world got a lot more expansive. Things were taken to the next level on a technological level, on a filmic level, on a cinematic level. So everything, all those action scenes that you saw that were so crazy in the first film, took things to a whole other level. Because I'll be real with you guys, let, I'll, let's be real. The As cool as the um, lobby scene is in, in The Matrix, as cool as that, again, look, watch that fight between Neon and Smith. It was cool. But for action junkies like 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 me, if now compare that to the the in Reloaded, that car chase scene is one of the greatest. It's the greatest car, car chase scene of all time. The fight in the chateau, that's the greatest fight choreography ever put to film in history. You know, and when you look at um, just how the world expanded, when you're now learning about the programs and about programs that are exiles and so forth. The story just got deeper. What was already a complicated world and story on the surface in part one, it's peeled it and went through. And I just think for some people, maybe they didn't see that, but that Reloaded did what a sequel is supposed to do, is take risks, expand things, and, and make things even bigger. And also as well, which is what most parts have to do, it's finished on an absolutely incredible um, cliffhanger. And I think just like Empire Strikes Back, the ending of Reloaded completely flipped everything that we knew about what we saw in the Matrix, what we we saw about the One, and we what we also saw about, about about Neo. And when you just look at where things were left, you were like, "Wow!" Everything that we were led to be, believe in Part One and for most of Part Two completely got thrown in our face, and we're, and we're just like, "Oh, this is just another system of con control." So I just think that you know. Reloaded for me, it is one of the great sequels, and I just feel that people that sort of just say, "Oh, it's but like see, Revolutions was a mess." Forget that. But I just think Reloaded did what a sequel is supposed to do: improve upon the first film, and I think it's improved upon Matrix in terms of the fighting, the story, and the philosophy. So, like for me, I can understand people that can say, "All right, the Matrix as a because the Matrix as a film 
maybe works better for, for some, but, and, but I want to keep it as objective as, as, as possible. As a sequel, and remember, the whole job of this top five is how good that first film was, how perfect that first film may be, and the difficult task of you creating a sequel that's followed up from that. And for me, Reloaded did that amazingly because, in my opinion, that is an extremely worthy sequel of a film that many people would say is almost impossible. It's almost impossible to follow up that kind of film that was the first Matrix. So Reloaded gets to number four. Number three. So I'd have been there. Aliens, man. Aliens. Aliens, for me, is one of the great sequels ever made. Let's break it down. Ridley Scott, one of the great directors that we've ever seen, amazing director. He brings out Alien. People cite... Alien is, Alien is a classic film. And people cite Alien as completely changing the concepts of sci-fi horror. Nobody had ever seen a film like that. And that film, for many filmmakers at that time, I think it came out like, I think in the late 70s, it was extremely influential in terms of um, how he, scary he made space and how he made a horror. So you look at something like an alien in terms of the incredible direction, the incredible use of prosthetics, the incredible the way in which he effectively put across claustrophobia and just the way he presented the character of Ripley walking in the confined spaces of there's now an alien on, on this spaceship. There is, it's almost impossible to follow that, that, that up. So obviously I think James Cameron, I think he sort of walked on Alien and I think he did some drawing boards and everything. So James Cameron looking at Alien is like, I can't follow that at up. It's impossible because he knew that for really Scott, this is obviously so, some of that I'm sure he viewed it as a, a, a mentor and a sage for himself. Like, I cannot do what this guy did. So he said that, I want, I want to do a sequel to this, but I've got to flip the script. And this is just where James Cameron is such a genius. Because he said, I'm going to do a sequel, but I'm going to change the genre. It's still, and that was just the bridge. So wait, wait, can you do that? Wait, what? Can you, no, no, it's, it's, Alien was um, horror sci-fi. Part of it's going to be horror sci-fi. So no, 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 no. It's a sequel. We're following up the story. We are increasing the story of Ripley, but I'm going to change the genre. The story is continuing, but I'm flipping the tone of, um, um, of the film. So you see, for Reloaded and for Empire Strikes Back, they still kept within the same genre. They expanded on the part one, but they kept within the same genre. James Cameron said, no. As a sequel, we could have given this guy something new. And I just think the brilliance of Vincent, I'm going to change the genre. So what you saw in Aliens was he, he made it an action sci-fi. So what was a horror sci-fi in part one? He made it an action sci-fi. He brought in an ensemble cast. And many people have, several people and several films have copied that idea of like this ensemble crew with these characteristics and 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 so forth but game over man game over man game over so so many guys have copied that and i and again people i believe i'm right sigourney weaver was nominated for an oscar for a performance in this film because james cameron was like look we've got to expand the character of ripley as well so where she was resourceful in part one She's resourceful in this, but she but she takes much more of a proactive lead. Um, so and and this is the king of my aliens. I don't know if you can watch the director's cut. Now the original cut is still amazing, still an amazing action film. But when you watch the director's cut, that is where you see how incredibly amazing this film is. Because you think aliens is good, you watch the director's cut because everything makes sense. I think it's what mutes the the little girl makes they make sense and the prosthetics and the use of effects on like the the um the alien mother the mother queen is incredible it just shows that james Cameron, no no one cares about cgi cgi is freaking trash the prosthetics used on that when when you see the alien mother basically flip and so forth it's 
it's it's iconic and that thing see prosthetics can never age prosthetics like that can never age so for me aliens for me is that represents the brilliance of a sequel which is that it improves upon the first one but in a very different way see there's still people that prefer the first alien but watch aliens the director scott you may still prefer the first alien but you, you have to argue that bro this is an improvement on our first film. It still doesn't make the first film any less a classic, but that director Scott, in terms of just the scope of the story, how he expands the story, how he brings in the backlog, and just what he does on a directorial basis in terms of thriller, a bit of horror there, action sets pieces, the different situations, and dealing with so many different characters and so many pieces, and how well he represents the, the aliens in it, and that final um, confrontation, I just think it's amazing. So yeah, Aliens gets uh, the number three. Number two. There we go. Godfather two. So again, this is this 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 is this, this we're not talking big time. God, the first Godfather is seen as one of the greatest films ever made. People cite Marlon Brando's performance in the Godfather as one of the best performances ever made. People cite the screenplay by Mario Puzo and Francis Ford Coppola as one of the greatest scripts ever made. How do you follow that up? How do you follow that up? Because what makes Godfather different, because with all due respect to Alien, The Matrix, Star Wars, Godfather is seen as one of... See, in none, none of those films are seen as one of the greatest films ever made. But Godfather is revered amongst people in the cinema so when thinking about the sequel for the couple and i think puts were like look when we're making a sequel on this we, we, we have to say what's up we have to say what's up and it was almost a blessing in disguise because i think Manon brando didn't come back for part of so they had to sort of okay if we can't get brando back we have to now because i'm sure they would have used brando if he was able to come back and say no if brando's not coming back we're not caught up from this from a whole new angle Say, okay, look, check this out. We're going to go Italian with, 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 with this. We're going to really look deeper into Vito Corleone, Don Corleone. And we're going to tell, see, The Godfather just a straight up story, like about this family and so forth. Godfather 2, it makes the, it is a lot more complicated because you now have the story of Michael and how Michael is now becoming this brutal leader. That is scary, bro. Alpha's performance in that thing is outstanding. But then you also have the so it's there's sort of stories running in parallel. You have the story of the of the son in the present and the story of the father in the past. And then because Kublai wanted to be that real real, it was it was in Italian. So De Niro and all the acts around the house pretty much learn Italian, especially the dialect of that time, to tell the story of Vito back in the day when he just came off the boat from Italy into America and was now and, and showed how he made his ways into really saying what's up um, in, in America from uh, an, an, an immigrant coming from the shores of Italy. So just for me, Godfather 2 is the superior film. Like people can say that you prefer Godfather 1, 100% and with what Brando did, but Godfather 2 is an incredible piece of filmmaking because the scope of that film is ridiculous the acting in that film is ridiculous and i just think that the way in which the two stories are told and how well they're told where you're not confused by either of the story and both of the stories are compelling which is the story of michael dealing with now having to be the godfather and the story of Vito now learning the background of the character that Marlon brando introduced us to in power one is amazing and also because what De Niro did, because De Niro, you know what, because he actually watched a lot of footage of the first one because he wanted to speak exactly like how Brando spoke, but obviously in a younger version. So Godfather 2 for me is one of the greatest sequels of all time, but it's not number one. It's not number one. It's not number, number one. It was close, but it's not number one. So what is the greatest sequel of all time? So this is the number one greatest sequel of all time. Back to the future part two. 
So let's run the, the tape. Back to the Future is a perfect film. Back to the Future is a perfect film. It's a 10 out of 10 film. It is the definition of cinema magic. Incredible lead, incredible co-star, incredible chemistry between your two leads, a, a very, very inventive, imaginative story. And Robert Zemeckis, obviously Bob Gill was his writer, Robert Zemeckis tells the story in an incredible way, an absolutely incredible way. And when you just look at how that film ends and it goes, you're like, this is, it's a, it's a perfect film. It is literally a perfect film. How the hell do you follow up that? <laughs> that, because that is what you call stupid. All this stuff is like, this is all quality film, but that's what you call cinema magic. Because that is a perfect blend of drama, adventure, and comedy. Just a perfect blend of all those things. You've just caught lightning in a, in a, in a bottle. So how did you do that? Again, blessing in disguise. So when we're doing Back to the Future 2, obviously they wanted to bring back Crispin Glover, who played Martin McFly's um, father, George McFly, but he wanted too much money. And there was an issue with um, having to pay him and everything. So eventually, because he wanted, I think, again, contract to, dis to, to disputes, they now said, okay, we're not going to use it because the idea for Back to the Future 2 was that we couldn't go back to the 60s. Would have been derivative, not good as part one, boom. So they now have to think of a whole different story because George McFly wasn't going to come back. So what they did was, which is what every great sequel should do, is let's take things to the next level. So in Back to the Future 2, not only do they go to the future and build the future, they go to the past and reference events that happened in, in part one. So again, the scope is taken to a whole new level. The story is expanded to a complete exponential way. And because there are so many moving pieces and now this becomes even much more complicated, that's where that dot comes into it, that degree of difficulty and just how well Zemeckis and Bob Gill were able to handle a future and a future that is... Because, bro, just think about this. They go to the future and it's, it was crazy bright and everything. Then a dude gets a book, which means that he can predict the future. He now goes into the past, gives that book to his younger self, who now bets on things, which and that now means he now changes the whole future. So the future is now a messed up, crazy, dystopian place. So, man, so you now have to now still about that almanac, go back into, into the past and now re-change what the story is. I mean, the dynamism of Back to the Future 2 is frightening. It is frightening what these guys were able to achieve and how these guys were able to execute such a complicated story where you're dealing with three timers, you're dealing with the present, the past and the future and you're never confused and everything makes sense while still maintaining the comedy, while still maintaining the amazing chemistry between Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd. So for me, that has, that's why I put in Back to the Future 2 as the number one greatest sequel of all time. So guys, there you have it, man. Tell me what you think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? I want to hear your thoughts. And also as well, you know, what other top fives do you want to hear? I mean, I've, I've got a, a few top fives to, 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 to think about. So I'll try and keep you guys in for the next few weeks. So all that can be said is like the vid, subscribe, share, do all that lovely stuff. And I'll see you next Friday for another top five. Peace.